sometimes it feels like you only get to stop and to think about a patient or a case, really think, later that day or maybe later that evening or days later, long after you feel like you can do any good. Why is that? Well, you're overworked. So many people need your help, and staffing is just not what it used to be. There are no beds. The place is creaking under the pressure of just one more thing added to your plate. Situational awareness is not just what is happening around you. It's also what's happening within you make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Hiroshi is an 18-month-old boy who is brought in by his mother for diarrhea. He's had frequent watery bowel movements over the past three to four days, and now Hiroshi just looks uncomfortable. He won't eat. He won't drink. He cries. On exam, Hiroshi looks miserable. You walk in the room, and you get just a glimpse of a glance. For that split second before Hiroshi sees you, he was in his mother's lap, the back of his head supported by her chest. He was looking down, breathing a little faster than you would have liked. You walk in, he clocks you immediately as a threat. He turns to his mother's embrace and cries. Stranger danger for sure, but there was something in that first look that bothers you. As you're speaking with mother, all you can see is his back. He looks pale. He may be a bit dehydrated. Nothing out of the ordinary for the family lately. They visited at a family member's home a few days ago, but no one was sick there. Otherwise, he's been with his mother, his father, his older sister at home. There's no daycare. There's no known sick contacts, no fevers, although he may have felt flushed a few days ago. He had one bout of emesis a few days back. Mother's been giving him bland foods and sips of water. Today, when he seemed uncomfortable, he wouldn't eat. She thought that maybe his belly was hurting him. And then later, he had some pink-tinged stools today, and she was understandably concerned. You remember his vitals from triage. Heart rate 130, blood pressure 90 over 60. Not that exciting for an excitable boy. His respiratory rate was 30, which is not crazy for a toddler, but his oxygen saturation was 97%. Hmm. Mama has been a pro, and she's gently rocking him while you talk. She's calming him nicely, and you gently place a warmed-up stethoscope on his back. Clear lungs. No real increased work of breathing. You gently re reach around to his belly. You slowly press. Initially, you get an okay exam. There's nothing obvious, but Hiroshi is on to you now, and he bats your hand away. A firm knock on the door, and it opens quickly. The charge nurse announces, We have another critical medical patient coming in by EMS. You excuse yourself. Make your way to the medics. We're waiting for you. A child in status asthmaticus. He's going to need some aggressive management. You start treatment, talk with the parents, get the team on board, tell them you'll be back to check on them. Okay, what was I doing? Hiroshi. Yes, uh, I don't know. I Acute gastroenteritis. We'll try some Zofran while we get the rest of the department going. Something bothers you. But what is it? Trauma patient, ETA five minutes. Okay, let's go. This is your life every day. 
And chances are your fast thinking, your pattern recognition, your patient illness scripts are usually correct. That is, when the patient fits the script. A Danzatron, Zofran, was a bit of a stall tactic, wasn't it? The child is dehydrated. He's not taking anything by mouth. Mom has been really giving P.O. challenges all day long for the past several days. And of course, P.O. is best. And most of these stable children will not need IVs. But he was pale. And he was, I'm going to say, irritable. Something about him was not right. And what was else I forgot to ask them? Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot to ask them what was going on at the family gathering. You go back in. Hiroshi doesn't seem to care that you're there anymore. He just won't take anything, doctor, says mom. You talk with mother about likely needing an IV, helping him to hydrate, and also we should check a few labs to make sure he's okay. Mother is amenable. Mrs. Tanaka, I forgot to ask... What kind of family gathering was it the other day? A large reunion on the family farm. Labs trickle in. Sodium, 135. Potassium, 3.9. Bicarb, 20. Okay, acute gastroenteritis, I guess. Another phone call. Three more EKGs push in your face. Two more side discussions. What was I doing? Uh, yeah, Hiroshi, um, AGE. Let me get his paperwork ready. Uh, okay, the CBC is back. WBC, 21,000. Sure, AGE. Hemoglobin isn't back yet. I'll, I'll just double check before he goes. More sidetracks, more patients. Let's recheck Hiroshi. He seems brighter. He's tackling a pop right now. Mrs. Tanaka, it looks like we'll be able to send you back home. Yes? A critical lab? Oh, okay. Excuse me. Hiroshi's hemoglobin is 5.7. Platelets are 55,000. You make a beeline back to your computer. You just need to recheck everything. The BUN is 60. What am I missing? You've seen this movie before. You've been in this movie before. Our clinical environment is seemingly designed to sabotage us. So let's get some intel. Let's find out all the tricks that are used to trip us up. There are a few cognitive biases that are at play here and that we can talk about in this very common situation. Maybe we get caught up in diagnosis momentum. This is when a previous clinician makes a diagnosis or an impression, and you just go with it. You're biased because you see what you see through the lens of a finished thought. We have to be careful when we admit patients and during our handoffs to the admitting team. We have to be specific about what we know and what we still don't know to help them further take care of the patient. Hiroshi may have been seen a day before and given the diagnosis of acute gastroenteritis, and you go with it. The reactants bias is something we're not seeing with Hiroshi's mother today, but I am sure that you have felt it in the past. The reactants bias happens when our autonomy is threatened. The patient with a degree from Google University tells you that he did his research and he has x whatever that is instead of weighing the pros and cons of this info we react but it can't possibly be x whatever you say it is a typical situation is when a child is sent for an eval of rule out appendicitis and the child looks well or doesn't immediately seem to have all the classic signs you can react and be biased one last cognitive bias that may come in handy in Hiroshi's case specifically is the unpacking principle. It comes into play when we don't take a moment to unpack all of the relevant information that we have in front of us. Little clues that are left unexplored. For example, 
What do you mean by tired or lethargic? Or what was going on at the family reunion? Another way the unpacking principle can get us is if we don't sort out each piece of information and lay it all out, unpacked, to see the broader picture. So, let's unpack. We have a small child who was in contact with farm animals three days before the start of nausea, vomiting, and now lots of diarrhea. No fever. He looks slightly unwell, and his abdominal exam is not exactly reassuring. Now, all of that can be framed or reframed in various ways, but I think it's safe to say that these features would prompt you to think of more than just acute gastroenteritis. Unpacking more, we have a pale child who is anemic without any real reason. He has low platelets and now has renal dysfunction. If I just gave you a new reframe of anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure, a very shy triad, one that needs to be sought out, searched out in acute diarrheal illness with the right exposure. You have the hemolysis, you have the uremia, we put it all together, and you have hemolytic uremic syndrome. Much more than just acute gastroenteritis. This shy triad is the typical presentation of HUS. In the setting of a diarrheal illness in a child less than five years of age. There are other causes of HUS, including HIV, autoimmune disorders, and some medications, but these are much less common in children and more often seen in adults. Typical infectious HUS is mostly foodborne and mostly due to the contamination of E. coli 0157. This strain is notable for the toxin it secretes, the shiga toxin. It's the culprit in HUS in children in over 90% of cases. The other infectious disease-related agent is pneumococcus. Pneumococcal-associated HUS is more often seen in small infants and young children and really doesn't affect adults. The epidemiology around HUS is changing with more use of higher valency vaccines. In the case of pneumococcal associated HUS, it's not the shiga toxin, of course, that's the culprit, but rather an increased expression of pneumococcal surface proteins that overwhelm plasminogen. As we remember, plasminogen is what keeps the blood flowing. It degrades clots so that once the clot has done its job, it gets cleared out and recycled. If you overwhelm plasminogen with all of these pneumococcal surface proteins, you tie up your blood's cleaning crew and you end up very prothrombotic. Shiga toxin related HUS is the most common type, and we call it Shiga toxin whether E. coli makes it or whether. Shigella makes it. Of course, Shigella makes Shiga toxin as well, but in resource rich countries, we don't see Shigella infection very often, thankfully. The nomenclature can get confusing, and it's been updated recently. If you really want to nerd it out, may the odds be ever in your favor. We can summarize that now we just call it Shiga toxin, whether it comes from Shigella itself or E. coli 015757 or any other variety of enterohemorrhagic bacteria. The messed up thing for our gut and also a real kudos to the standards that we have in food production is that the actual inoculating dose of E. coli 015787, that Dose is very, very small. One study estimated that as few as 10 living E. coli organisms can produce enough toxin to cause the disease. Mind-blowing, right? The upside is that the E. coli themselves 
stay in the gut and they rarely cause septicemia, but the toxins that they secrete definitely get into the bloodstream and cause a toxemia. Now, our immune systems are a work of art. They can usually tell us apart from the foreign invaders. They can ramp up or ramp down their defenses and they can keep us healthy if we do our part. The immune system has a very limited repertoire when it comes to isolating toxins. The shika toxin in particular is that mean friend enemy, the frenemy that looks harmless enough to you, the immune system, but goes behind our back to get all of your other organ systems to hate on you. That is, the toxin creates a prothrombotic state by inhibiting plasminogen, activating platelets, and other parts of the coagulation cascade. What was once a community of coagulation cascade collaboration, everyone worked together to thin or thicken the blood as needed to protect the community, the shiga toxin frenemy spreads toxicity everywhere and gets everyone fighting each other, and the end result is chaos and thrombosis everywhere, multi-organ system dysfunction, and a smiling, self-satisfied shiga schadenfreude. The anemia is hemolytic, so you'll see an increased indirect bilirubin and increased LDH. You also see a decreased haptoglobin. Remember, haptoglobin is like the designated driver in a raucous night out. It hangs back and waits to be needed. Haptoglobin is a plasma protein that circulates and contributes to the osmolality of plasma, waiting to be needed. When a red blood cell falls apart, gets too old, starts getting sloppy out there, haptoglobin binds the hemoglobin within it. It retains it, retains its iron moieties, and it protects the kidney from exposure to hemoglobin that can cause damage to the nephrons. So it recycles and it protects. So if there is an overwhelming hemolytic anemia, then haptoglobin gets used up very quickly. Your labs may also report schistocytes or helmet cells. Lactate dehydrogenase, LDH, is an enzyme in the cytoplasm that helps in cellular metabolism. It's in almost every tissue and released when the tissue is damaged. So LDH, in the case of hemolytic anemia, just means cell turnover. Platelets are consumed during the thrombotic cascade. Interestingly, even though there is a low platelet count, the ones that survive are actually well-functioning. They just were not caught in the carnage. We typically don't see petechiae or purpura here early on, and you for sure can see it a little bit later, especially when the patient is sicker, which is kind of a weird specific thing in HUS. Again, based on its unique pathophysiology. Damage to the kidneys in HUS is variable. It can present as a mild hematuria to oligoanuria to severe renal failure. You may pick this up with the toddler or young child who comes in having a diarrheal illness, ongoing, maybe there's some little bit of blood towards the end, but the child seems a little droopy, a little dehydrated with an elevated blood pressure. That just doesn't match typical volume depletion and dehydration. Hypertension is common in the renal injury seen in HUS. Another thing to watch out for is the child with reasonably normal looking vital signs who is given some fluids. Maybe you've drawn labs because you're concerned about a protracted illness. You give a little bit of fluids because you already have an IV and the fluid response is out of proportion. You uncover a hyperrenin state. So to illustrate, a three-year-old has diarrhea ongoing, now a few little specks of blood, looks a little tired, not tolerating PO, something doesn't seem right, heart rate is reasonable, maybe the 130s or so, blood pressure 98 over 60, you send some labs, you give some normal saline, 
recheck the BP, and now it is 130 over 80. That is too high for a three-year-old, and a very weird response to a small bolus. I want to emphasize something here. The information you get and the assessments you make can really help to formulate our best understanding of the etiology. The initial snapshot is so powerful. Communicate whatever you know or think that you know, think that we understand with the admitting team. It just gives them another layer, another richer part of the picture. Now, I say this because most of the time the causative agent is foodborne or explained in the history. But sometimes the admitting team needs to go fishing for other causes. We talked about HIV or lupus or complement factor deficiencies. If all else fails and the child's not doing very well with HUS, they may need to do a renal biopsy. My point here is that in the hustle and bustle, key pieces of information may not be communicated. And that prompts a whole different cascade of testing and testing and testing and testing and testing. All right, so you nailed it. HUS, high five. What now? Let's talk treatment. The good news is that many will recover with supportive therapy. Now, we say that a lot, right? What does that mean? What does supportive treatment mean? Supportive therapy, supportive treatment, it looks different depending on what the underlying issue is. Supportive treatment in toxicology could be fluids or benzodiazepines or just a dark, quiet room. Supportive treatment in HUS means critical care. Careful, meticulous attention to the many details that are obvious on presentation or may subtly show themselves later. First, the anemia. We have pretty low transfusion thresholds in children in HUS. Most would recommend transfusing only when the hemoglobin is near 6 or 7, or the hematocrit, of course, drops to 18 to 20. Now, if there's an oxygenation issue or poor perfusion, then treat the patient, not the number. But I just wanted to paint a picture of these lower thresholds in transfusion because it's all about the risk-benefit ratio. There is no need to transfuse platelets routinely. If the patient has significant bleeding, and not just a little bit of gum bleeding, mucosal bleeding, but significant bleeding, then go ahead and transfuse them. So now we are at fluids and electrolytes. You have to make sure that there is enough volume that the kidneys see to perfuse and recover. So make sure you go small, frequent aliquots to give them enough perfusion to the kidneys to get them to work again. Look specifically for developing hyperkalemia or hyponatremia or really any emia the kidneys happen to show you. Take care to evaluate and replete. This child needs admission to a monitored bed. Now, here comes the tricky part. Who needs dialysis? About 50% of children with HUS will have severe renal failure. They may present with uremia, azotemia, so elevated blood urea nitrogen, fluid overload, or say hyperkalemia that is not responding to your medical therapy. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Sometimes it's hard to get consultants to get excited as we are about how sick the patient is. All of these parameters are a sliding scale. It's all relative, right? One helpful piece of evidence that I'd like to share with you is via an unexpected friend, the liver function tests. Talathi et al. published a study called Serum Transaminases at Presentation and association with acute dialysis in children with hemolytic uremic syndrome. In it, they found that if the ALT and AST are normal, the need for dialysis is often very low. When both the ALT and AST are higher than two times the upper limit of normal, the need for dialysis is very high. My take on this 
if the thrombosis is so bad that the LFTs are affected, we got to push for dialysis. This may mean that you're putting in a central venous catheter. Now, remember, in young children, this is not a resuscitative line initially, because even in the hands of someone who does this daily, it takes time in the little ones. We have to be careful and slow with these. You can't just pop them in during a code. Now, I find that when the specialist may be on the fence, if I can take one thing away from them, one barrier away from care, maybe it's just getting that line in. Maybe that makes the difference in the plan. Now, that's big talk, right? Because that line will take you out of commission for some time. If the department is falling apart, you just need to delegate that. But having said this, maybe you should. If you have central venous access, the admitting team can do hemodialysis or continuous veno-venous hemofiltration or continuous veno-venous hemodialysis or continuous veno-venous hemofiltration. This is usually through a double or triple lumen catheter like the Quinton catheter placed very similarly to the central venous access catheter that we usually do with a few modifications. Hemodialysis through these lines is going to be temporary. These are non-tunneled catheters, uh, but just like in hemodialysis, blood is pulled off one lumen, it's cleansed, it's processed, and it's sent back through the other lumen. It's not as efficient as if you had a typical arterial venous fistula, but it's very effective. All of these modalities will help resolve the uremia, the overload, the electrolyte abnormalities. The differences really uh, among them uh, are really just have to do with how gentle and how fast and what size molecule can be eliminated. So just for review, the continuous veno-venous hemofiltration, CVVH, removes large molecules. Continuous veno-venous hemodialysis, CV VHD removes medium-sized molecules. And CVVHDF, hemodiafiltration, it's the best of both worlds, even smaller molecules. For children who are doing relatively well, but will likely need longer-term renal recovery, a pediatric surgeon can place a peritoneal dialysis catheter. Again, not in the hyperacute setting, but that's a few days later, possibly, if no emergent dialysis is needed. If your child with suspected HUS also presents with hypertension or a disproportionate rise in blood pressure after a small amount of fluid, you may have to initiate antihypertensive therapy acutely. Calcium channel blockers are a good choice. Nicardipine is nice because you can titrate a drip. ACE inhibitors are a bit controversial because if you already have renal dysfunction, they can reduce renal perfusion even further. But then there are some experts that argue just the opposite and they maintain the renal protective effects of ACE inhibitors long term. You know, I say start with calcium channel blockers acutely, and if the inpatient team wants to change things, that's great. It would be rare for the child to seize in this setting, but if there is a seizure with HUS, you should treat it like any other seizure, but you might be more aggressive with the blood pressure control because this may be a contributing factor. There are other inpatient immunomodulators that they may try subacutely to try to resolve the renal injury. But watch out also for cardiac consequences, including ischemia and maybe stunning. The myocardium may not be able to deal with such an overload. You can treat this, of course, with dialysis, but in the meantime, fluid restriction and an ionotropic agent. If there is frank pulmonary edema, you may have to intubate and start positive pressure ventilation. The watch words here are skepticism and anticipation. There is a slow burn in HUS until a threshold of injury occurs, and then these children can suddenly get much sicker, much faster. Use your best judgment.
In summary, HUS is AGE+. Plus. It's more than just run-of-the-mill viral or bacterial acute gastroenteritis. It's a second sickening of sorts. This is why our history is so important. If the child had an exposure, has symptoms, then presents without fever and with bloody diarrhea, do a good exam and have yourself a think. You aren't doing any labs for most well-appearing viral gastroenteritis, and that's wonderful. This, though, is AGE+. Plus. Something doesn't fit. If there's any doubt, get that CBC, get that chem panel, and LFTs. You may just pick up that shy triad of anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.